Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to all of you. I'm very pleased to introduce to you Dr. Sagar Tiwari, an old friend and an ex-fellow of CSDS as well. Sagar is a historian of modern India and teaches at the OP Jindal Global University. His PhD thesis was an intellectual and constitutional history of the tribal question in India, which focused on the discourse over scheduling of forested and hilly regions in Central and Eastern India. His uh, book is coming out soon, hopefully this year, and it looks at the administrative, anthropological, and nationalist frameworks surrounding the quote-unquote Aboriginal tribes in the late colonial period. Uh, this book we are expecting will be an important intervention on the very live and uh, contemporary history of the fifth and sixth schedules of the Indian constitution. Sagar, thank you very much for joining us. And Sagar is going to speak on a very important but understudied character of Indian history of our modern times. Sagar, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Pratmadi. And uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, first, I would like to acknowledge uh, uh, a few people and uh, the long time that uh, these ideas have been under preparation uh, merits such an acknowledgement. So first of all, uh, um, my alma mater, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University, Center for Historical Studies. I did my PhD uh, from CHS and submitted it in 2014. Uh, my supervisors were Dr. Sangeeta Das Gupta and Dr. Rohan De Souza. Um, they have commented on these ideas many times. And uh, after that, um, those great years in JNU, I uh, was very fortunate to uh, land myself uh, one year visiting fellowship to CSDS and in there uh, and I'm uh, again very lucky to uh, get my in get, get this invitation from CSDS uh, because um, the ideas around Jaipal Singh Munda that I'm going to speak on today uh, my thesis has mainly I mean mm, as, as Tatmadi said, uh, it's mainly about the discourse of scheduling. It looks as at, at administrative, nationalist, anthropological frameworks. But Jaipal Singh Munda, in my thesis, was a very uh, marginal figure. I mean, he comes in in the last uh, chapter. But uh, there is this section called Jaipal Singh, uh, uh, Jharkhand Movement and uh, uh, Constituent Assembly, and that these three huge chunks of research themes, I could only write 10 pages in my thesis. Um, and it was only after I joined CSDS and uh, you know, was party to a number of uh, very interesting conversations with uh, Pratmadi, uh, with uh, Professor Abdendra Sharan, who's affectionately called Deepu, sir, I, I call him Deepu sir. Uh, and um, that, that many of these themes were, uh, uh, you know, they could pan out to the presentation today. Hopefully this uh, work uh, on Jaipal Singh Munda will constitute my second book. Uh, and uh, I have uh, gathered a lot of archival material, primarily from uh, Delhi and Patna and Ranchi. Um, my wife, uh, Dr. Meera Vishwanathan, who's also a JNU trained historian uh, has had to, you know, um, manage uh, infant uh, for two consecutive vacations because I had to go to this Patna archival trip, um, and without her sacrifices, I couldn't have get got this off the ground. So uh, my uh, greatest thanks are to Pratmadi Deepu sir. Uh, Mira and uh, CSDS also uh, nudged me to think and write in Hindustani and provided me a platform to 
uh, start uh, writing academic pieces in uh, Hindustani. Uh, and, and for that, I'm deeply grateful to the Indian Languages Program and particularly to Professor Abhay Dubey, um, who is no longer in CSDS, but uh, hopefully uh, my uh, words shall reach him someday. Um, so, uh, uh, and lastly, uh, this archival project uh, that we received after I, uh, I mean, last couple of years, uh, we've been um, uh, doing more archival work uh, under the ages of uh, some a small grant that we received from Dr. Ramdeyal Munda Tribal Research Institute in Ranchi. So uh, Saurav Mahanta, Dr. Saurav Mahanta has done the bulk of this work and uh, my own supervisor, uh, Sangeeta uh, Dasgupta is at the helm of this project. Uh, Ufak too is part of the team. So hopefully we will uh, put much of this archival material in the public domain in the foreseeable future. But for now, I will dive straight into the character that uh, is the uh, raison d'etre for this meeting. And um, uh, this is uh, the, the, uh, the main argument that I'm going to present is uh, going to be published in a journal named Modern Nation Studies uh, later this year. Uh, it has been accepted uh, for publication there. Um, but uh, for now, um, I will begin with a little, you know, sketching up of a background picture. Why Jaipal Singh Munda becomes uh, an important figure to relook at? Um, why is he forgotten? Why is he at the margins of historiography? Uh, these are some of the key questions that I'll try and grapple with in this presentation. Um, but uh, to begin with, uh, as I said, the, my thesis was on the scheduling debate. And uh, while I was working uh, through that discourse, I realized, uh, and, and this question uh, rather deeply informs my work, that what happens to a minority politics which does not have an own elite to represent its interests? I could ask this question because uh, there were a group of anthropologists, administrators, social workers, missionaries, who were all debating, discussing the future of tribes in the late colonial period. But I could hardly hear, or the archives could not uh, give out many tribal voices. And uh, Niladri had, I mean, my uh, MPhil supervisor, she, he, uh, many times has had nudged me to uh, stay away from status discourse, to look for the tribal voice. And frankly, uh, in the entire discourse up until 1935, I could not find many tribal voices. Uh, they're few and far between some resolution in the legislative council, uh, is raised, but that that those are flashes in the pan. They, they don't constitute a sustained mobilization, a sustained campaign for articulation of ideas on uh, how to give cultural autonomy, how to protect land rights, uh, and so on. So um, uh, a very uh, important um, byproduct of this non-tribes uh, discussing about tribes uh, is that even today, uh, and this is the big find of my uh, thesis, hopefully uh, when the book is out, I shall, uh, I mean, uh, it will be out in the public domain with evidence. But um, the answer to my question, which I posed, what happens to that minority politics without, which doesn't have an own elite to represent its interests. Um, uh, I discovered that it got trapped in the so-called Ghudiye Elvin debate. Now, Ghudiye is a Marathi Brahmin. Uh, Elvin is a Oxford Englishman. Uh, and they are apparently uh, discussing the future of tribes uh, in the early 1940s. And even today, much of what is presented as historiography and sociology of tribes is is centered around isolation and uh, assimilation. So 
Guria is supposed to be a votary of assimilationist school of thought, and Elvin is supposed to be a votary of isolationist school of thought. Uh, however, um, I realized, and this is the main argument of my work, is that they were actually debating for and against scheduling. So Elvin was pro-scheduling, Gourier was anti-scheduling. So this isolation versus uh, assimilation, it is uh, no, uh, I mean, uh, for some reason, reams have been written about Gourier and Elvin debate, but hardly any literature exists on the politics of scheduling. Uh, which is centered around this constitutional instrument of putting certain areas uh, in British India under a special inventory uh, administrative regime, which will be administered on a different footing. The logic of administration will be different. So um, Guri Elvin debate is a myth for sure. And uh, uh, the reason why I uh, term this uh, presentation as Jay uh, Adivasi or Jep Jepal Jep Adivasi, a forgotten sega of minority politics, is that uh, in this period, 1935 to 50, a change happens. And the change is that uh, tribes actually start coming into the picture. They start voicing uh, their aspirations and demands. And Jepal Singh Munda in this time period emerges as. Uh, the Marang Gomke or the Supreme Leader, at least in East, large parts of Eastern and Central India. So uh, it is this eruption of uh, a very confident, blunt, and at times shrill tribal voice, which uh, Jaipal Singh Munda uh, characterized as Adivasi voice. Uh, that is uh, the, the main concern for today's uh, lecture. And uh, uh, before I go into uh, the nitty gritties of uh, Jaipal Singh's tumultuous career, I shall like to begin with um, a piece he wrote in the Times of India on the occasion of the first, very first Republic Day, which will be two days later, uh, celebrated two days later uh, in absolutely chilly weather, um, literally and metaphorically. Uh, so this is um, what he says. And uh, I read out and I'm, uh, I would urge all of you to look at the number of times he uses the term Adivasi. This is the very first Republic Day. Industrial development has forced Adivasis, particularly in the Chotanagpur Plateau, the beehive of India's heavy industries, to shed isolationism and come out politically to protect their interests, their hearths and homes. The Jharkhand province movement has caught the imagination of all Adivasis throughout India, and Adivasi political renaissance receives its inspiration largely from Chotanagpur. Here, there is a well-organized political party, the Adivasi Mahasabha, which has chosen to compel the Adivasis to play a role of honor in the national life of the country. Today, Adivasi organizations exist in every Aboriginal track. Same piece. The Jharkhand movement will continue, will grow in strength, more so as several of the Chotanagpur states have been wrongly put under the central provinces, uh, as Clement uh, demands, continue to may to be made by Odisha for the industrial district of Singhum, as West Bengal cries for the return of Manbhum, and Adivasis themselves realize that their salvation lies not in the splitting up of their groups be between three states, but in the formation of a separate state of Jharkhand so that Adivasi development may be assured. Now, the point uh, 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 that I wish to highlight in this uh, particular extract is that. Um, the, he's trying to, Jaipa Singh Munda is trying to, and by this time he had been trying for over a decade, to shift the discourse on scheduling and talk about new state, a new regional formation. And I think it is this uh, new regional formation uh, that uh, he gives voice to, uh, which is called Jharkhand. Uh, and, and, you know, there are efforts by Adivasi intellectuals to look 
uh, at how far this idea of Jharkhand goes back in time. There, there are uh, stray references that I found out in which uh, Jharkhand is supposed to be a name which comes up in Sanskrit texts, in uh, also Persian texts. So there is a constant uh, urge to uh, look at a past which uh, where Jharkhand was there uh, right now because of certain colonial uh, interventions, the position is not good. But if we can achieve it, we will have a you know, promising future, if not a golden future. So this is the idea, this is the dream that uh, uh, um, Jepal Singh Munda and Adivasi Mahasabha is uh, centered around. And this dream is uh, uh, not uh, to say uh, this dream uh, uh, is not uh, Japan Singh Munda is not the progenitor of it. There have be, there had been uh, earlier uh, attempts uh, during um, the Simon Commission where Adivasi uh, politicians activists from Chotanagpur Plateau and uh, Santan Pargana had. Uh, deputed and given evidence that we want some kind of a um, separate province, if not a separate province, a sub kind of sub province. Uh, but those demands could not bear fruit at that time. Uh, however, in 1935, with the passage of the Government of India Act, uh, an entirely new situation germinates. And this new situation uh, is that um, three things happen. The uh, diarchy regime changes into provincial autonomy. Uh, there is, uh, number two, uh, there is a move from uh, uh, calling it backward areas to partially excluded areas. And entire Chotanagpur Plateau and uh, Santal Parganas are declared as partially excluded areas. So uh, the earlier uh, nomenclature was uh, backward areas, backward tracks, but now they are called partially excluded areas uh, and tracks. And the third and very important uh, development for this Jharkhand story is that uh, Bihar and Odisha itself gets divided. So 1936 notification comes out and after a long sustained movement on the part of Odia speakers, uh, Bihar and Odisha were uh, separated, formed into separate provinces. And this coming together of three uh, decisions all act in one go, almost in, in a span of one or two years, uh, it uh, opens up a space of imagining tribal future in an entirely different paradigm. Uh, because uh, scheduling, which was the main um, protective instrument of colonial statecraft, they have uh, you know, made this entire region a partially excluded areas. Uh, provincial autonomy meant a lot more power to uh, Indian representatives, local government governing bodies, a lot more money to them. Um, and uh, thirdly, if uh, Odias can have a separate state, why can't tribes, why can't uh, you know, this uh, thing, this dream of a separate province come uh, and, and be fructified. Now, there was a problem with this uh, iteration, with, with this dream and imagination. The problem was that uh, all earlier uh, states re, uh, reconfigurations, be it uh, the, I mean, I'm talking of 20th century uh, separation of, uh, say, Bengal presidency being uh, divided into two separate uh, parts. Then you have uh, separation of Bihar and Odisha from Bengal. Uh, and then finally, uh, Odisha and Bihar, Bihar separating from each other. Primarily, I mean, I'm not saying entirely, but primarily they are predicated on a linguistic argument. That linguistic reorganization of state was the watchword for any administrative regrouping of territories. Now, um, 
this uh, uh, logic could not work in as far as jharkhand is concerned because jharkhand had a congeries of tribe and uh, all of them spoke very different languages so uh, you not only have languages which belong to the indo aryan family but also to the dravidian family to the austro asiatic family and and how could uh, there was hardly any you know lingua franca to speak of which could uh, then be argued that together on linguistic grounds this uh, new formation ought to be given a space in the administrative uh, setup of 1930s uh, another uh, uh, setback and and jepal singh actually enters the picture after this major setback of 1937 elections 1937 elections uh, we uh, know that it was not based on universal adult franchise it was based on property qualifications tax qualifications educational qualifications and uh, though the uh, the number of people who could vote uh, expanded massively as as compared to government of india at 1919 uh, to 1935 uh, still given how um, poor and uh, you know what the levels of levels of education and um, other commercial activities was in many of these tribal areas uh, not many tribal voters were there on the electoral roads um, and uh, even then uh, congress did not have a you know a very strong robust organizational structure in chhota nagpur and santhal pargana uh, but still it uh, uh, won um, i think 5 out of 7 seats only one seat went to an adivasi uh, candidate named boniface lakra uh, another seat went to an indian a seat reserved for indian christians went to uh, ignes beck and these two were the only uh, tribal representatives who were uh, returned to the bihar legislative council uh, after the 1937 elections now out of seven seats eight seats if only two are going to uh, the legislative body then this was an hour of crisis for uh, the adivasis uh, who uh, thought that you know, you know this is uh, enough is enough we must build some kind of a coalition some kind of a united front whereby our differences are set aside and we stop this dissipation of the limited votes that we have under this uh, you know uh, electoral system in which not everybody has a right to vote uh, and this uh, generates uh, a very strong uh, consensus amongst the various organizations of chhota nagpur plateau uh, and region and together they uh, come together uh, to to constitute what was called adivasi sabha and uh, this is happens in 1938 um, the um, many of these initiatives were actually taken by uh, uh, christian bodies because they had the most educated uh, tribal uh, you know middle class section thanks to you know long years of missionary work in um, uh, chhota nagpur region uh, and out of these uh, uh, i mean i i just want to highlight uh, what beck and lakra said in a legislative council debate uh, which in which uh, shri krishna sena the first chief, uh, chief minister of uh, who was called prime premier or prime minister in those times uh, but, uh, he moved the resolution that uh, this uh, provision regarding excluded and partially excluded areas should be jettisoned should be you know taken back and uh, back in lakra spoke in this uh, debate and uh, bex uh, and they they said that they want a career of self determination for chhota nagpur lakra speech means no words in criticizing the congress government he said that while congress paid lip service to the idea of giving giving special representation special protection to minorities in reality its attitude had been rather cold unkind and unsympathetic towards the aborigines where there was a clash of interest between aborigines and non aborigines ministry had invariably swayed in the favor of majority before ending his speech he warned the congress ministry that if it was 
unfavorable towards them and continued to be hostile to our interest, the tribals of Bihar would claim a separate province. Uh, Ignace Beck in his speech says, and I, I'm quoting him, we feel we have been exploited and neglected due to our poverty and small number, and especially because we have no political organization. Having seen all these, we have happily started our own movement, the Adi Nibas movement. I would request my Bihari friends not to misinterpret this movement as being anti-national or anti-Congress. It is not a conspiracy. It is not missionary tactics. It is a sincere move for self-determination. If we have kept ourselves back from generously following into the Congress fold, it is not out of malice. It is for you to win our confidence. You must know that these aborigines are moving fast and that they are meant to live and live powerfully. This question of self-determination, this question of separation of province must not be confused or interpreted so as to say that they are anti-national. So uh, this uh, moment uh, can be argued that, you know, there's, there's this, that's why I've used this word eruption. Uh, so it's a very confident, blunt, at times even shrill voice, which uh, uh, foregrounds this, uh, moment of uh, Adivasi, dumb Adivasi hood. Uh, and uh, perhaps now uh, would be a good time to get into a little discussion on um, the word Adivasi. Uh, and on this, I have just an apps. Uh, I'm sharing my screen again. Please let me know if yeah, this is from, uh, is it visible? Yeah. This is uh, from the book uh, by David Hardiman, Coming of the Devi. So here he says that it is a combination of Adi, meaning beginning or of earliest times and Vasi meaning resident of. The Adi, uh, idea that the Ad Adivasis were the original inhabitants of India. This is a recent term not being in use at the time of the event described in this book, in the 1920s, that is. It appears to have been originated in the Chhotanagpur region of Bihar in 1930s, was popularized at a wider level by the social worker A.V. Thakkar in the 40s, and only became uh, used in uh, Gujarat on a wider scale after independence. G.S. Guria in his foreword to the Ju uh, Scheduled tribes condemns the use of the term as he feels it was question begging and pregnant with, mis with mischief. He believed that the concept was to be divisive, undermining the unity of the Indian nation. He preferred the term scheduled tribe, which is used in the constitution of India. Most con contemporary sociologists, anthropologists follow Guri in this, normally using the word tribe and tribal. Now, uh, uh, this uh, is of course uh, a dated understanding. We know uh, that uh, A.V. Thakkar could not possibly have uh, popularized this term because uh, uh, A, uh, he himself, when he formed this organization of social workers uh, in the, in 1948-49, he did not call it, um, he did not use the term Adivasi, he used the term Adim Jati. So, um, Thakkar, uh, and, and to this year is a centenary of, uh, uh, sorry, uh, this year marks the centenary celebrations of the organization that he uh, established in Panchmahal uh, district of Gujarat called the Bhil Seva Mandal. Uh, it was established in 1922 and this year uh, they are supposed to have some big celebration around it. So uh, Thakkar uh, had a, a Hindu missionary perspective on tribes. So he thought that tribes were part of Hindu civilizational makeup and could be included in its social structure as castes. Uh, because uh, in certain primitive, uh, primitivist understandings uh, underpinned his social welfare scheme. And in my uh, forthcoming book, uh, I have an uh, entire chapter dedicated to Thakkar uh, Bapa's uh, social welfare work. Uh, but that's besides the point. Uh, right now, I want to uh, just highlight that um, um, this, this politics of Adivasi, what 
who becomes an Adivasi is a subject of very intense debate. And in this debate, just to name a few uh, people, uh, scholars who have contributed immensely, uh, Andre Bete, Virginia Skakha, Nandini Sundar, Vinita Damodaran, Crispin Bates, Alpa Shah, Daniel Rycroft, Sangeeta Dasgupta, and uh, Prathamadi all have contributed to uh, the understanding of the meaning of the term and, and what uh, could it, you know, um, how, how does one um, say, um, you know, what kind of sense of belonging it gives, uh, what rootedness uh, it provides to uh, people who self-identify as Adivasis. Uh, Dilip Simeon, in fact, uh, in his own work in uh, on Jamshedpur strikes, he calls uh, uh, Adivasi as a composite category, which was a reflex of humiliation commonly expressed by Hoes, Mundas, Santals, and Oraos in the fields, mines, factories, at the hands of Dikus and or aliens. And um, the word Diku, again, uh, uh, is an old word for Chota Nagpur and has been used time and again in historical uh, interpretation and understanding. Uh, but in this period, the word Diku um, was used very, very uh, vehemently uh, by the Adivasi Mahasabha uh, uh, cadres and leadership to mean the Bihari. So the Bihari politician, the Bihari uh, businessman, the Bihari government employee, they were uh, seen as outsiders who are, uh, you know, uh, robbing the land uh, or, you know, who are, who are um, in a way, um, uh, cornering the profits of what should actually come to us, to all these disparate groups. And it is here that, um, uh, one needs to understand that Adivasi, the idea of Adivasi is actually, um, uh, it's an invention uh, and creation of a uh, exercise in which the proclaim, one who proclaims Adivasi hood. Uh, the nature of this claim is very modern. It's set, and it's a self-consciously historical form of assertion and claim making. Uh, it is not only about indigeneity or son of the soil uh, argument. It has a reading of history uh, behind it. Uh, I mean, besides that, of course, we have originated, but uh, there's this deprivation, exploitation, marginalization, all those categories are also uh, subsumed in the word Adivasi. Uh, so uh, in the administrative discourse, um, uh, what was earlier called backward tribes. Uh, this backward tribe category, it gets reinvented into a political category with, of the Adivasi. Uh, and it is this transformation from an administrative category to a political category, which uh, is very significant for this period. Because uh, uh, as Shekhar Bandhapadhyay has uh, said, and I would like to highlight that aspect. In this day and age, uh, we need to keep our understanding somewhat nuanced. Uh, so Shekhar Bandhapadhyay, sorry. In a uh, edited book, which came out in 2016 says, uh, and this is in relation to com Congress dominance of uh, uh, Indian politics at that time. But despite the fact that this, uh, that this anti-colonial freedom struggle in its last phase was dominated by the Congress, it is difficult to detect any political consensus in this movement beyond its anti-colonialism. As nation was still a space for contestation. There was tension in the ways national freedom was being conceptualized by myriad groups of people who constituted the grand nationalist coalition. Multiplicity of ideological positions and variety of interests often presented as indicators of factionalism were existential realities of Congress-led Congress nationalist movement. And 
this uh, approach to understanding decolonization and this politics of transition it has been missing in, in Indian historiography, especially vis-a-vis -vis certain groups which are not much written about, like the Adivasis. Uh, and um, uh, a few months back, I uh, came across this brilliant uh, Australian historian. I have not read his history works yet, but uh, I would like to talk a little bit about him um, and then foreground why figures like Jaipal Singh Munda lie at the margins. Uh, Henry Reynolds, he, he was this uh, uh, initially school teacher of history. Then he realized he was posted in North Australia and then um, found out that Aborigines, Australian Aborigines had not been written about. And then he devoted his, in, his life to uh, historicize their predicament. Uh, so the first three points are uh, taken from this memoir that he wrote, Why Weren't We Told, which came out in 1999. And uh, he uh, says that it was an expurgation by omission. So they were deliberately left out of these narratives. Uh, second point, he says, is that there's a myth of peaceful settlement that, that was pervasive in historiography around Australia. Uh, peaceful settlement in our case would be the constitution making exercise. So uh, I'm, I'm deliberately using uh, this analogy because uh, more often than not, the making of fifth and sixth schedules and the discussions around tribal predicament in India have been focused only around the constituent assembly debates. But the reality uh, of what transpired cannot be gathered if we uh, frame our lenses only on the CA, only upon the constituent assembly. The third point, he says that it's, it's also uh, an act of evasion and hypocrisy. Uh, so these three were his points. Uh, the last two, which uh, I mean, I agree with these three, uh, as far as my own work on Jepal Singh Munda is concerned, but I add two more points to it, which is the subaltern effect and uh, the question of silence and agency. I'll read out uh, my critique uh, because it comes out better uh, in the way. Yeah. few points needs to be made about the relative silence around uh, silence that surrounds Jepal Singh Munda, both in historiography and in the public domain. Unlike Birsa Bhagwan, Munda could not be easily appropriated within nationalist frameworks. While Birsa predated the rise of Gandhian nationalism, Munda was a contemporary of Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. Also, the organization he spearheaded was at the forefront of an intense political tug of war with the Indian National Congress. In Chota Nagpur, the Congress organization had little genuine tribal representation and was dominated by caste Hindus from North Bihar who had settled in the region. The failure of the Congress to accommodate tribal political voices within its organizational structure in Bihar generated tremendous friction. The breakdown of the negotiations eventually led the Mahasabha to represent Biharis as the quintessential Deku exploiters, outsiders. A related and key factor in the othering dynamic was the Christian identity of the early Mahasabha cohorts of leader, leaders who were mainly tribal converts to Christianity. Hence, the religious composition of the Mahasabha stirred an undercurrent of anxiety on the part of overwhelmingly caste Hindu Congress. As such, the Muslim League was also reaching out to them for a possible alliance against the Congress. These fault lines led many contemporary nationalists to brand Adivasi Mahasabha movement as separatist and anti-national in character. Um, uh, coming to the silence and agency question, a central question which my study hopes to address is the question of uh, tribal agency beyond outside nationalist frameworks. As such, this remains an issue not, an unrelated, uh, not unrelated to the co-option of tribal movements in the pantheon and mytho history of nationalism. The nationalist forces claim to represent the interests and aspirations of each and every segment of Indian people, including the tribal communities. However, this a priori claim of the Congress nationalists was called upon or called into question by the movement conducted by the Adivasi Mahasabha. Thus, it constituted a serious challenge to the legitimacy of the most powerful mass organization of 1930s and 40s. 
uh, and in this uh, uh, whole framework, why there is a silence of, uh, I mean, nationalist historiography is silent on Japan Singh, but why is subaltern studies also silent on him? And in here, I have a critique, which uh, is the following. This extract is from uh, the uh, manifesto of Ranjit Guha on some aspects of historiography of colonial India, published first published in 1982. Uh, and uh, uh, I will not read it out. I don't have too much time. But uh, Guha here stressed upon three aspects of mobilization, which distinguish the domain of elite politics from that of subaltern politics. While the former achieved mobilization vertically, the latter did so horizontally. The elite mobilization had a relatively more legalistic and constitutionalist orientation in contrast to the subaltern approach, which was relative, uh, relatively more violent. And lastly, the former was more cautious and controlled while the latter was more spontaneous. Inspired by Guha's clarion call, many studies of tribal movements followed on proposed lines in the volumes of subaltern studies. Also, his elementary aspects of present insurgency in colonial India marks a watershed movement, movement in, in modern Indian historiography and has a, had a long effect on uh, tribal history in particular. Through uh, uh, Ranjit Guha's method of reading against the grain deployed on the prose of counter insurgency marked a tremendous methodological leap and created an academic space for empirically valid historical narratives of tribal groups. This approach also had distinct limitations. For one, while it looked to recover the rebel consciousness, no rebellion in the past had been a normal occurrence. Um, so my reason for articulating this critique is because my proposed study is an inquiry into a tribal movement, which was clearly modern in its appeal and followed well-established methods of association politics. Like its nationalist counterpart, the Adivasi Mahasabha's orientation was legalistic and constitutionalist. Its responses were cautious and controlled. Uh, and uh, very little recourse was taken to organize violence through the threat remained in the backdrop through public displays of militant symbols like bows and arrows. Uh, so um, uh, this sum total, uh, I would argue, uh, is behind uh, this neglect of Jaipal Singh Munda uh, in formal modern Indian historiography. Though in the vernacular space, Jaipal Singh Munda continues to be debated. So when I went to Jharkhand and Rachi, I could see at least four or five full uh, volume works on Jaipal Munda. But he is trapped in a um, binary of either hagiography. Some people are, uh, you know, they have always waxing eloquence on uh, Jaipal Singh Munda, while some are iconoclastic. They they. Uh, say that he was a stooge of imperialists and uh, that uh, he was part of a Christian missionary conspiracy and so on. But um, there have been very few sincere attempts to A, uh, look at his contributions outside the Constituent Assembly, which has been done by Pooja Parmar in a good article. But uh, uh, her depiction is limited. I mean, uh, I would argue that uh, if we move the lenses away from CA and focus on the regional dynamic, on what he was doing to uh, change the political landscape of uh, Chhutanagpur, then a lot more interpretation and analysis can be generated. So for instance, uh, the first, very first, uh, um, I mean, when he came to the fore as the leader in 1939, uh, he gave a speech, blistering speech, uh, which was given in four languages, mind you. So his linguistic dexterity was phenomenal. I mean, he knew, he, he could understand most of the dialects uh, and languages being spoken in the region. And he could speak in many of them, not all, but many of them. So very often, in fact, uh, uh, police in trying to decipher what he was saying, actually uh, uh, was unsure what he was saying, because he was speaking in a language which was unknown to the uh, policia informant. Uh, and uh, this is what he says at the very first meeting of the Mahasabha meeting, where uh, he's chosen as the president of the Adivasi Sabha, and he renames it as the Adivasi Mahasabha, or the Grand Assembly. The Adivasi movement stands primarily for the moral and material advancement of Chota Nagpur and Santhal Pardhanas. 
for economic and political freedom of the aboriginal tracts and in some for the creation for a, of a separate governor's province comprising uh, roughly of Chota Nagpur and Santal Pargana with a government and administration appropriate to its moves. We suffered by being appended on to Bihar. In separation alone lies the salvation of Chota Nagpur. We will be content with nothing less than an existence of our own, a separate province, a separate government, a separate administration. We must help ourselves. Our great future is in our own hands. Uh, end quote. Now, a separate province, and this is a point I want to stress upon, uh, is a different demand from being separatist or secessionist. Uh, and Congress politicians from um, the cadre to the top leadership unendingly represented Jepal Singh Munda's uh, movement in secessionist terms. Uh, see, th this is also a decade. Uh, the, the movement when he's carrying it out, uh, late 1930s, 40s, uh, communi communalism uh, and religion becomes the dominant trope of Indian politics. And in this uh, decade, uh, tumultuous decade, uh, we haven't really understood 1940s at all on its own terms. Uh, not anachronistically, we can say partition was inevitable, but uh, serious uh, scholarship uh, will, you know, will bite it, will bite that, I mean, uh, and, and say okay, it's not possible to um, uh, be sure about it. Also, uh, amongst uh, the non-Congress politicians who decided to support the British war effort after the Congress ministry resigned, uh, which include uh, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, uh, V. D. Savarkar, Jepal Singh Munda is also amongst them. And uh, he uh, gives quite a lot of support and uh, you know, becomes part of the recruitment uh, campaigns. And uh, there are no reliable estimates, but uh, from what I have encountered, 4,000 and some scholars like Nirdosh Kumar, they say 7,000 uh, recruitments have happened, uh, had happened during the Second World War, uh, whereby Munda, primarily Munda people were going into the British Indian Army. And many of these were actually returning back after the Allied victory and becoming part of the Adivasi Mahasabha movement. So they became foot soldiers on the ground. Um, and one of the primary uh, weaknesses of Adivasi Mahasabha, and because of which it depended heavily on uh, allies, was money. Now, modern associational politics cannot be conducted without money. And uh, I have seen records of Adivasi Mahasabha uh, meetings uh, in annual meetings, which were the biggest congregations, where 20,000, 40,000 people were congregating in a single uh, maidan in Rachi. The total uh, collection was 300 rupees, 400 rupees, peanuts. You cannot conduct uh, or you cannot even you know, give a living wage to absolutely committed cutters. So what they do is, uh, and under Jepal Singh's leadership, they, they start instituting what is called soup dhan scheme. Soup dhan scheme means uh, that at harvest time, each tribal uh, Adivasi cultivator would, uh, who's associated with the cause, would give one soup of grain to the, uh, you know, as a donation, as a grant to uh, uh, the carders, and the carders would either, you know, um, eat it or sell it in the market, get some money and then uh, sustain their mobilization campaigns. And uh, this uh, mode of, you know, um, almost penurious uh, being amongst Adivasis in a very rough political climate where uh, there is a lot of uh, hooliganism and violence, frankly, uh, which, um, also precipitates some uh, showdowns. So there are, uh, uh, very archivally speaking, three or four major shootouts that happened in the 1940s. I'm talking of Sarai Kila Kharsava, uh, Tapkara, and uh, um, in Gangpur state in 1939, there was one. So in all these uh, um, showdowns, there are people who are shot dead. Uh, and Adivasi Mahasabha uses, uh, or I would not say use is a bad term, 
it it creates martyrs out of them it it you know it commemorates their sacrifice so there is a very distinct modern uh, mode of conducting politics that japal singh munda does and uh, now uh, i'm uh, pratmadi how much time do i have pratmadi the past 50 minutes if you wind up in about 5 minutes if you can okay, okay. a little more about jaypal singh really if uh, you have something uh, okay. okay uh jaypal singh um, well uh, people usually know what i mean uh, lobi sendra his autobiography is something that uh, it is out in the public domain uh, uh, but uh, jaypal singh in himself is a uh, uh, he has heroism he is the first uh, sports superstar so to speak uh, people know that uh, indian olympic hockey team won eight gold medals uh, across various olympics but the very first gold uh, gold was won with uh, jaypal singh at the helm of that team um, in the political domain um, he his main uh, contributions can be delineated uh, in uh, industrial uh, setup so jamshedpur he plays a very active role uh, in 1939 he, he uh, around the crisis around tata centenary uh, celebrations uh, he uh, breaks the hegemony of abdul bari um, and and you know props up that supports uh, manik homi again um which uh, has uh, been documented by dilip simian netaji subhash chand bose uh, uh, comes and you know he allies with uh, jaypal singh and in fact uh, there's an interesting tale that jai hind um the slogan jai hind is actually um, inspired from jai adivasi so when subhash chandra bose uh, um, saw uh, so many people uh, saluting uh, jai adivasi or jai uh, marangom ke jai jaypal singh munda uh, this idea was then translated to one of the most iconic uh, salutations be- because uh, jai adivasi was uh, again a unificatory term when he made uh, the indian national army which was drawn primarily from british indian army which had uh, sikh regiments rajput regiment etc etc and all of them had their own salutations but uh, when they were made to fight the british indian army uh, on the borders of northeast india uh, the salutation between them was jai hind and that jai hind was a direct of shoot from jai adivasi uh, so this is one interesting bit that i can offer um, otherwise um, Uh, there is uh, uh, a lot of uh, material that we will put in the public domain uh, through the archival project that i have uh, already pointed out there is one interesting bit uh, which can uh, yeah so in the second phase uh, of movement making that jaypal singh munda was uh, conducting in at the helm of affairs he uh, he devised a new idiom of doing politics for adivasi communities and formed youth and women's wings within the adivasi mahasabha at political meetings of the mahasabha songs were sung dances were performed and green uh, flags with figures of birsa munda were raised like a great leader jaypal singh gave new meanings to old symbols for instance at a public meeting in rachi he stood up to declare arrows and bows were symbols of their religion like sikhs who kept five things with them always these meetings were often attended by thousands of adivasis who ch- uh, chanted loud slogans of jai adivasi chhota nagpur santhal pargana ki jai matribhumi ki jai garib adivasi ki jai jharkhand province lekar aayenge lastly i mean this is absolute concluding remarks um, and if i if you give me 5 minutes i'll read it out do i have that go ahead go ahead okay so this period uh, especially after 47 uh, that's what i'm i wish to talk about 
it was a period of tenuous legitimacy of post-colonial Indian nation state. Uh, the task of pa uh, pacifying, there were tribal rebellions all across. I mean, some of them were led by communists also. Uh, so it fell on uh, the nationalist leadership. And in this uh, paradigm, the Congress were fighting to a two-pronged battle, militarily against the communists and electorally against the Adivasi Mahasabha with the course, uh, control of a highly coercive ex-military apparatus just emerging out of Second World War, the Congress-led governments in Hyderabad and Bombay could violently repress the political challenge of the communists. While the Congress' success against their communist rivals was a foregone conclusion, the charge raised by the tribal autonomy movement under lead leadership of Jaipal Singh and Adivasi Mahasabha required tricky political maneuvering. The challenge for the Congress was to rein in the Adivasi movement, especially its bid to divide the politically important province of Bihar, which was home to many tall leaders of the party, including the president of the uh, Constituent Assembly, Dr. Rajendra Prasad. In the bitter tug of war for political dominance, Congress chose to procrastinate the resolution of the tribal question until the closing months of the Constituent Assembly. Moreover, in order to buttress its own rank and file, congressmen needed to win allies in the Chotanagpur region. Also in a land of promised, uh, land of universal adult franchise, the Congress could ill afford to be seen as working against the interest of Adivasis. The choice was clear. It could only opt between keeping Bihar as a unified state or sticking to its long-held principled position of repealing the provisions of excluded and partially excluded areas. Thus, it was pure political expediency that the Congress chose former over latter. It disregarded the demand of Jharkhand and agreed to incorporate the provisions of the fifth schedule. However, the incorporation was allowed only on the terms dictated by the Congress. And as, a, as a result, certain key modifications uh, about tribes advisory council were shunned. Uh, they were done away with. So in the ultimate resolution of the tribal question uh, through special provision of the uh, Indian constitution, the role of tribal agency is discernible in two ways. Uh, so uh, besides uh, Ignace Beck, Boniface Lakra and Jaipal Singh, uh, uh, Jepa Singh Munda is also part of the subcommittee which was headed by A.V. Thakkar. And um, uh, he uh, submitted notes of dissent that uh, uh, why are you descheduling? And, and large parts of Chotanaku Plateau were actually uh, descheduled by uh, the post colonial nation state, uh, primarily to, I mean, to, to subdue the uh, energies which were there in the Jharkhand movement. Uh, but Jaipal Singh and his uh, heroics, in a certain way, gave a visibility to the tribal question in this last phase of constitutional politics. And uh, despite having a deficit of sufficiently broad-based English-educated and vocal middle class, uh, the successful mobilization campaigns of Jaipal Singh Munda led Adivasi Mahasabha, the tribes and Adivasis did claim a share of national attention and political visibility. Uh, had it not been for these resistances, it was highly unlikely that the Indian National Congress would have agreed to the inclusion of the fifth schedule areas as part of the Constitution of India. Though both forces ultimately got dissipated and many of their cadres got absorbed into the Congress, they played a historic role in breaking the Congress's hegemony and position in predominantly tribal areas of the Indian support. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much, uh, Sagar. Looking forward to the, the, work, the archival project being completed. It's really important work, thanks. So uh, uh, what, let's take some questions. So uh, the attendees, please write in the Q&A box. Uh, we'll read out your question. Uh, this is the webinar mode, so I'm afraid uh, we cannot see everyone, uh, but please go ahead and write. Uh, Sagar, may I, uh, and we have uh, colleagues in the room who will also have some comments. Sagar, may I, uh, may I uh, start? I, mean, I, I get the point entirely when you say that we should look away from the Constituent Assembly debates and look at actually the playing out of the regional politics. Absolutely. I just wanted to, I had one question about the constitution making moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was quite interested to hear how you uh, call it, and rightly, the moment of settlement as it were, a national settlement. So is it uh, not true that in the Constituent Assembly debates, um, Jaipal Singh and Fizo from Nagaland were two people who had brought the quote-unquote tribal question in very different ways. 
and uh, if I'm not mistaken, there have there had been some exchanges between Fizo and Jaipal Singh as well. The Naga question and the and the Jharkhand question, the Adivasi question, and the tribe question. Um, so it would be interesting to see how, because it was not yet settled the question, um, how that played out uh, in terms of the uh, the not the, the the jurisdiction of the constitution itself uh because there there are debates in the constituent assembly where you know whether the constitution as written by this assembly would be seen as a sovereign document for the for the entire land or not and in parts mm -hmm. including from jharkhand there were voices who were saying that this cannot be our constitution it has to be another if if a different representational structure is not there this constitution and of course it's being headed by ambedkar so mm -hmm. uh, it's a really interesting dynamic playing out there so if you had any thoughts on that so i would be very interested uh, um, yes, Sagar, hang on because of the time should we take one or two more questions and yeah. uh, you can respond just anybody okay prabhat here has a question and hilal so let's take these three and then uh, we'll take more from the screen as well Uh, thank you, Sagar, uh, yes, for this <coughs> beautiful presentation. Uh, uh, one thing, uh, I'll come straight to uh, my question. Uh, I want to know uh, basic information, uh, for instance, uh, regarding the solidarities that Adivasi Mahasabha in the 30s and 40s seek. So is it geographically limited to this uh, Jharkhand, I mean, basically, uh, tribal areas of West Bengal, Odisha, and, uh, and 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 Bihar, or does it also approach or uh, try to uh, <coughs> have uh, gains uh, associations or solidarity with, say, hill tribes, or for that matter, say, uh, in other regions of of, of, of India? Uh, if at all, then what was the nature of it? And one trivia. Uh, so he's uh, uh, genuinely uh, regarded as uh, the sports star of that time uh, because of leading the team. But there is also a counter narrative, especially amongst the non tribals uh, of Bihar, that he left in between. So basically, kind of betrayed. Yeah, secessionist. Yeah, thank you. Ha, Hila. Sagar, thank you very much for uh, this very thought-provoking presentation. I really enjoyed. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, in fact, uh, as I said, it's thought-provoking. So again, it forced me to think through the two points which you made. Uh, not You did not elaborate them, but in a passing reference, you emphasized them quite adequately. Uh, one was the relationship between political category and the administrative template. Now, this is crucial uh, that if we just divide that contextually before 19, and you are right, I agree completely with you that 1940 must be uh, evaluated historically on its own. But if I follow you, then the question would be uh, that the political vocabulary of discourse in the 40s uh, could be uh, distinguished or there is a very interesting distinction between 40s discourse and the 50s discourse. In the post-constitution period, uh, we have constitution as an entity, as a reference point to do politics. While in the 40s, everyone is free to think freely about the possibilities and the future of India. Now we have to recognize these two moment. And if we go back to this political category and administrative category, uh, Adivasi versus scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, I think if we look at uh, this figure, because unfortunately you didn't get time to elaborate uh, the complexity of this figure, which is uh, Jepal Singh. 
I think if we look at uh, the interplay between political category, that is Adivasi, and the administrative template, that is Scheduled Tribe, then if we, you know, we find a very interesting uh, move that this term is used. Sir, I lost you. I lost you. Your last sentence, last five seconds. Yeah. Okay. Take it quickly. Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can. I'm just saying that if we just go back to 50s movement when constitution has become a reality and it's a reference point. To, so the meaning of this political term, the political expression called Ivasi would also change. Mm -hmm. that the reference point would entirely be the template called Scheduled Tribe. Mm -hmm. So the political reference point to the Adivasi would always be Scheduled Tribe. If that is the case, then, the, then it would become important for us to unpack the meaning of this political expression called Adivasi for which a reference point is an administrative template called Scheduled Tribe. This is the question I think which uh, I would like you to say more. Second thing is again going back to 40s. Uh, and this is something which you also referred to uh, that if we go back to the debate on representation, uh, some way or the other, the post 1940s and in the, in the 50s, uh, territory specific form of representation became very powerful. And if mm -hmm. we just go back to 1956 moment and look and read carefully the State Reorganization Commission report, I think this territory is emphasized again and again. So the question is, uh, how should we look at the question of representation? Is it community or territory when the constitution is a reality and is a strong reference point for doing politics, uh, whatever form we like to uh, have it in post 1950. Yeah, Sagar, why don't you take these three and then we'll take. Uh, um, thank you, uh, all three questions, especially uh, Hilal sir, excellent question. Uh, it's a, uh, uh, but I'll try and tie these three up and uh, answer um, all of you. Uh, Pratwadi, uh, Ambedkar, uh, I mean, there's this, um, notion of Ambedkar as an anti-Congress figure. Uh, and this anti-Congress figure uh, of Ambedkar uh, is thanks to a number of tracks that he wrote, uh, Ranade Gandhi, uh, Jinnah, or what Congress has done to untouchables, etc. Now, um, um, Ambedkar was, uh, or came into the Constituent Assembly, um, as uh, a member from Bengal. And when partition plan was mooted and then passed by the Congress committee, uh, Joginath Mandal sided with uh, Jinnah and Muslim League and uh, he lost that seat. Ambedkar thereafter comes uh, on a seat which is vacated by a Hindu Mahasabha leader uh, M. R. Jaikar, who was also a legal uh, honcho of his time. And uh, mm, uh, when he was trying to come in, Patel no less said that uh, doors as well as windows are closed for you. Uh, so it, it took mm, someone like Gandhi's intervention to ensure that Pan Ambedkar re-enters the Constituent Assembly uh, and once he does that, his anti-Congressism gets mellowed. I mean, I have talked to uh, Prabodhan who has, you know, devoted many years of uh, his life on studying journalistic writings of Ambedkar. And this is from him. I mean, uh, uh, that yes, it can be argued that Ambedkar after his re-entry into the Constituent Assembly is more to, I mean, I'm not saying that he became uh, an agent of the Congress, but his natural uh, instinct of anti-Congressism, it, it gets mellowed. And that plays into uh, the constitution making process in the sense that uh, we get an extremely powerful center. Uh, the, the, I mean, Ambedkar, yes, is a constitutionalist, 
but i i mean something which i could not do in this presentation is you know compare uh, jaypal singh with ambedkar uh, uh, jaypal singh's imagination is more federal so is say fizos uh, imagination is also more federal but the moot question in 1947 is whether we will have a strong center or we will have a weak center and in that uh, politics ambedkar uh, sides with the congress and in these uh, in even in the uh, mellowing down of the provisions of fifth and sixth schedule uh, not sixth but fifth schedule definitely tribes advisory council was lost all its teeth and all those amendments were brought in by ambedkar it's a recorded fact i mean it was a shot that the congress took from his shoulders because they were safe shoulders he was a pioneering leader of dalits who could uh, say ki he is anti uh, you know adivasis and that related to that uh, 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 prabhat sir uh, prabhat's question uh, sir uh, i would say that his uh, imagination and, and in in that sense uh, uh, the articulation of uh, adivasi politics by jaypal singh munda is a regional formation yes in its in its core it's a regional formation but it is transcending individual tribes there is no uh, i mean um, um, there is no one tribal group which is uh, privileged so it's not a mundai stan it is an Ad adivasi stan even if he is using it is a land of adivasis he, it is not ho urao munda uh, any other tribal group santhal uh, so adivasi uh, uh, idea was yes a regional formation but there are there is evidence that gurkhas uh, and uh, other hill tribes are actually approaching uh, uh, jaypal singh munda for some support how far does it uh, translate into organizational uh, matters is something i cannot uh, I, have, i mean i i don't have absolute control over that material yet uh, but i am in the process of processing them uh, so some day perhaps i will be able to answer you more uh, on the basis of what i have observed uh, and hilal sir's question uh, excellent question sir uh, i i would say that um, uh, and this is part of my uh, book's argument uh, also that up until 1935 when this discourse is handled mainly administrate at an administrative level uh, the nationalist participation in this discourse is very very minimal tribes were at the margins of that discourse uh, in the first uh, round table conference nothing no discussion happens second round table conference also no discussion happens only in the third round table conference some little discussion happens because uh, narayan malhar joshi who is the labor representative from bombay raises it on the behest of thakkar baba so uh, only when uh, winston churchill no less makes this statement in the british parliament that uh, on the debate on scheduling that um i wish that the entire indian peninsula is excluded from this constitution or partially excluded then the nationalist eyes open you know ye kya ho raha hai matlab this uh, uh this this then spills over that is my argument that the administrative discourse which was territorial in conception uh it spills over in the domain of politics and that spilling over has uh unintended consequences nationalists could not fully control it because then adivasi politics also gets a boost from this act of spilling over uh, and uh, this uh, i would say that uh, again uh, to your question of the 40s i think also uh, the effect of the second world war on indian politics has to be reassessed uh, because second world war it in itself uh, when it started uh, it looked highly unlikely that india will get independence it was promised dominion status even by stafford cripps cripps is not giving independence in 42 and that's why you know quit india movement is uh, in a way enunciated but um, once uh, 
British lost heavily across the globe and their might got uh, severely weakened. It became absolutely impossible to hold on to earlier colonies, including India. Uh, and in that uh, framework, early 40s and late 40s are a very different ballgame, politically speaking. Uh, uh, even uh, their original plan was to exit in July 48. Uh, but Mountbatten comes and says, no, we uh, June 3 plan, we will exit in a few weeks. So uh, in this uh, quagmire, in this chaos, mayhem uh, and, and turmoil, um, uh, many figures uh, like Jaipal Singh, uh, who was, as I said, uh, many of his uh, followers actually got salary jobs. Uh, so Adivasi question at that point, I think also became, becomes a class question because then uh, uh, it is no longer only about cultural autonomy. It is also about uh, a very modernist conception of, I mean, Jaipal Singh Munda is not saying ki jal jangal jameen chahiye. He's, as I said, as I uh, showed you in at the beginning, he's all for industrialization, but on what terms? And that is the key question for me, that his vision for the place of Adivasis, not a scheduled tribe. Scheduled tribe, again, is an uh, amendment in the constitution. Uh, uh, the earlier term was Aboriginal and Hill tribes. This is also amended by, the, uh, by Ambedkar. Uh, the amendment to change it to scheduled tribes comes via Ambedkar. Uh, and... Uh, Lastly, and this is an important point, I think, uh, the, um, uh, the reading of history, which Jaipal Singh has, uh, is heavily predicated on the Aryan invasion theory. Uh, while uh, Ambedkar uses a more nuanced reading of that Aryan invasion theory, uh, to make to create his own politics, but Jaipal Singh, unlike Ambedkar, is not a scholar. He he doesn't you know uh, Ambedkar learns Sanskrit and interprets these texts and uses them to create this uh, image of Indian history where Brahmanism and Buddhism are at loggerheads with each other. But uh, Jaipal Singh do, is actually looking at Indus Valley for inspiration, mm -hmm. and and it is this. Uh, um, you know, he, at one point he calls himself a primitive nationalist, uh, while Ambedkar in the 1930s is uh, about uh, he is calling himself a protestant Hindu or non-conformist Hindu. Uh, it changes mid 30s onwards, but there's a taxonomical ferment in this entire period. Categories are not stable, mm. and it is this un instability of categories that. Uh, generates a lot of politics of which is around the numbers. Uh, and uh, Arjun Appadurai, uh, for instance, has used this concept of predatory. Uh, I'm, I'm forgetting exactly uh, what it is called. But there's a. Mm, predatory identities, yeah. Right. So, shall predatory. we. Talk sorry, sorry, sorry to cut you off. Huh. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Or be Saval Hena, let me read out quickly. Uh, Vidisha Dhar from uh, Tripura University agrees with what you are saying and feels that her own experience of working with artisans of Lucknow, uh, vis a vis the question of archival presence, is pretty similar to what you're saying. So she's uh, joining you in the raising the question of how to reread archives. Uh, there's a second question. Um, um, which asks why Ambedkar gains pan-national attention, but Jaipal doesn't. But he, he or she also asks that between hagiography and missionary conspiracy, there is a third position apparently, which is about why Jaipal also joined the Congress at the end, and that it might have been a betrayal of the Jharkhand movement, which had taken, as you rightly said, a more Jal Jungle Zameen uh, turn by the 60s and 70s and so on. Uh, well, come down, Ayodhya. Then there is another question on, um, right, how the, how the category of the tribe in India is different. You already mentioned the Australian uh, first people's idea. 
uh, and the quite and and Af tribes in Africa. Um, so why is the tribe question so under debated and uh, in India as opposed to say even in Africa or Australia or of course Canada? Uh, there's another question. I'm sorry, I'm just reading them out quickly. Just keep a note, uh, just to make time. Uh, Utkarsh, you can also see them in your box. Yeah, you? I am seeing them. Yeah. I'm just reading it for for the rest. Um, uh, quite intriguing the way you ref reflect on historiography. Uh, the Utkarsh's fieldwork is also on Chota Nagpur, and where that Sabha is now much split after post 90s. Um, I see the Sabha's attempt to uh, homogenize uh, Adivasi rituals and festivals across villages has resulted in this kind of a uh, and and the rise of village priests apparently um, and their cooptation, you know. So basically, you get the hint. Mm -hmm. Where has the movement gone? Uh, hi, Nandini. Uh, do you have a question? Um, I can see this is Nandini, but I don't. Uh, maybe it's the chat box. Uh, there are some questions. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I, uh, may I? Yeah, I yeah, can yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. We'll find the other questions. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Vidisha, uh, uh, for agreeing with my critique. Uh, we go a long time back. She was my classmate in MA and uh, a fellow Janiwala. Um, about the uh, uh, the third position on how he betrayed the movement by joining the Congress, it is well known that you know uh, that that uh, it is seen as a stab on the back. But what is less well known, and what is what comes out in the fortnightly reports that I have seen of uh, Bihar in the nineteen fifties, is that there are murmurings within administrative ranks that he's actually mulling this uh, uh, soon after uh, States Reorganization Commission uh, um, you know, rejects that demand. So it, he joins it finally in 1963, uh, the Congress, and is quickly set aside. But uh, the uh, and and only uh, an internal document, if there is one, uh, of discussions within Adivasi Mahasabha can reveal what are the factions who, um, you know, which were supporting this decision, which, which were not. Uh, we know people like Eni Horo and others uh, split away after uh, Japan Munda decided to go the Congress way. Uh, but uh, it's a less worked upon uh, area. And... Uh, a lot more archival work needs to be done so as to you know corroborate uh, different theories. See, all th all these theories are at best beliefs. Uh, we can believe in one theory or not, but um, as far as historiography is concerned, uh, we cannot uh, speculate without evidence, uh, and uh, the evidence. Uh, presents a more uh, nuanced picture, which it ought to be. I mean, after States Reorganization Commission cans the demand in 1955-56, it becomes very, very difficult to you know, see a future um, of, for, for the state. But I would argue that the energies that and the ideas that this movement generates eventually translates into other tribal states like Nagaland, Mizoram, uh, you know, uh, in the Northeast. Because even the Naga identity is not a singular identity. It is a generic formation. There are, there are many Naga tribes, which then come together, uh, not as Adivasi, but as Nagas, or uh, you know, uh, different uh, groups in Mizo Ram come together under the Mizo idea. So uh, this trajectory of coming together in a manner which is generic and which becomes a political category whether it translates into territorial homelands or not is a different question. But this idea that tribal territoriality can be politically articulated and um, a campaign can be mobilized and 
the the most important part of adivasi masabas and jharkhand party's uh, success story was this electoral success and it was not only uh, massive uh, rallies that uh, uh, japan singh uh, headed uh, he he was on he was the leader of 30 plus mlas in 1952 and 57 elections so almost i mean his his party swept the ground uh, once universal adult franchise comes into being and there are descriptions in santosh kiro's books that, that you know uh, his election uh, symbol was the cock and he used to travel on electoral uh, rallies with the cock on his shoulder uh, it was a trained cock but imagine the times that uh, you know uh, this man conducted uh, political mobilization campaign and electorally translated it into seats not one or two 30 plus 35 plus seats uh, which decimated the congress in the very first year of independence uh, very first decades of independence so it was um, uh, it it broke congress hegemony at multiple levels uh, and this is a story which needs to be told more uh, and i agree with the uh, the point that uh, prabhat uh, has indicated at that what were its larger dimensions it it's it's something that needs to be uh, worked out uh, archivally and last question uh i don't know much about the recent uh, history of jharkhand movement uh 1970s onwards i am frankly uh in um, shallow waters uh so once uh, and hopefully i'll have a better grip and at some other presentation i'll be able to uh, throw some more light on it yeah sagar i had a question uh, thank you very much there's so much to think about and learn from what you presented uh I had two questions that were kind of marginal to your presentation, so I thought I'll just put it to you and see where it goes. Uh, one is uh, even as you speak of stepping outside the Constituent Assembly, it seemed to me that much of the focus still remains on, uh, you know, on 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 words and ideas and and uh, ideologies as they were clashing with each other. Uh, as a consequence, it's only you know two minutes back that you speak about the way he traveled uh, earlier you spoke about how he spoke i think uh, uh, one way of getting out of uh, the constituent assembly is to look at the actual practice of politics and not mm -hmm. just the ideas that were contesting with each other because in that grammar of how people traveled spoke mingled ate uh, there's a lot to be learned and said and i think that's mm -hmm. something that Uh, you still haven't. Uh, it's it's as if you 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 recognize it, but you haven't stepped into it. So you still remain within the broad frame of what we'd call the political. You know who's contesting whose ideas in what ways. Uh, so that's one question. The other entry point was sports, and I was kind of surprised that sports find a kind of a marginal presence. Uh, considering how much sports and tribal identity has got mixed up uh, wouldn't it be interesting to look at uh, both politics and life in general uh, through the prism of sports uh, to throw a different kind of light uh, so is, so what i'm asking is is critique of the world studies from agency this that was of ticket uh, has to be done many people will do it Uh, but the other issues that you raise is it possible to actually seriously engage with them rather than just mention and park it uh you've got me deepu sir absolutely uh, i haven't uh... some other people in the chat box who also say the same uh, especially regarding sport and that it's not just part of it's not an aside either in jaipal singh's life or in tribal identity till today i mean naga mm -hmm. and football and uh, jharkhand uh, archery i mean th these are like central so much central to uh, the imagination and the archive uh, will have to be also of that 
Uh, just one or two more questions in the chat, just to, these are the last ones. Um, there are some comments about, uh, you know, what uh, what is uh, what was the industrial uh, uh, coal lobby's relationship to Jaipal Singh? Uh, wasn't there another battle that he was fighting um, as as well as the Congress? So that there's one question there. And uh, um, if you could share if Jaipal Singh had an involvement with the uh, Borderland, the Borderland question. So these are the last questions that you have. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor Sharon. Uh, Deepu sir, uh, you got me. I, I completely agree uh, that I have yet, I mean, what I presented as a very broad brushed uh, picture because much of my last two, three years, though I have collected a lot of archives, archival material, but my focus has been to finish my PhD book. Uh, so once I do that, I have done it. I mean, I, it's, it's on the mill. Inshallah, this year, uh, but after that, uh, when I uh, get on to that material, I will think on these themes more carefully. In fact, um, the, the model uh, that I want to follow is, is uh, Kumar, Suresh's, uh, Kumar Suresh Singh's book on Birsa Munda. Uh, that, you know, uh, you structure it thematically around, say, uh, ideas like land, law, and freedom, uh, and uh, weave a narrative around it in a manner that the grammar of the politics uh, is more visible and, and his uh, connect and his charisma with the people comes out more um, in, in more meaningful ways. So uh, that's a task that I have to uh, get down to. Uh, um, right now, my wife is on sabbatical and I am uh, uh, playing a, a supporting role. So after her sabbatical gets over and when I get uh, a fellowship, some kind of a time, I will definitely do it. So, uh, and your point about sports and is well taken. Uh, but again, um, sports history is something I have not uh, ever dealt with. I know it cannot be, I mean, if one, one were to visualize it as a biography, yes, uh, his superstar status as a hockey first Olympic champion has to figure in. But I'm looking at it as a political biography. Uh, I am not, I mean, I can see that he was a very good captain of the team, uh, both on the hockey field and in the political uh, rough and tumble of Jhar, uh, Chhota Nagpur and Santhal Pargana. Uh, in fact, if you read uh, Lobi Sendra, uh, his short sentences seem like the hockey passes that uh, one uh, would make in uh, on the on the field. But uh, sports and its relationship with tribal identity and uh, you know the physicality of it the body uh, and and uh, there's this uh, uh, evidence from uh, the archives where um, his mentor Con canon cosgrave he says that he has an eastern slimness and a western straightforwardness uh, so that uh, can be you know put to interesting interpretations. But yeah, that interpretative leap on uh, sports and its relationship with politics is uh, something which remains to be done. I'm uh, not yet in deep waters yet, but eventually it has to be tackled. Uh, about um, Bodoland, uh, I, I haven't found any evidence of Bodoland uh, agitation at this time, but Gurkha is definitely, uh, I mean, it, Bodoland is tied up with the Gurkha identity, yes. Uh, but those evidences, those, those uh, references are very uh, scanty and they, uh, they're not, they don't make up for a lot of meat around which a broth can be uh, made. Uh, but 
yes, as Prabhat's question indicated, one has to look at the wider implications of um, the Adivasi hood and what it did to Indian politics. Uh, in fact, the term Dalit uh, became a pan-Indian identity. Uh, Adivasi still hasn't become a pan-Indian identity. And uh, part of the reason uh, could be, and I think it is one of the uh, points of comparison between Ambedkar and uh, Jepal Singh, is that Ambedkar left a substantial written corpus, which kept his ideas in circulation. Uh, added on by uh, you know oral tradition of around Ambedkar uh, as well. So uh, Ambedkar has had the benefit of both orality and literary uh, circulations of ideas, uh, but uh, Jaipal Singh has, I, I feel, been trapped uh, in orality alone. There are some artifacts which uh, have been generated, some plays which have been written on him. Uh, there is a uh, oral tradition, not very uh, robust, but around Jaipal Singh, which needs to be documented. And uh, part of our project's effort has been towards documenting that uh, archive. So, um, yeah, so that is the reason why uh, perhaps this disaggregated nature of Adivasi politics, uh, it has not been strung together in a big paradigm. Uh, we have local, and, and that's my, that is my critique of subaltern studies, that you focus too much on the local, the regional and the para-regional context, which should come out if one were to, you know, take a more uh, broad-based picture, uh, fails to do so in the case of Adivasi politics. It has done very successfully in the case of Dalit politics. Uh, so uh, that, um, is a work uh, which has to be done, is work in progress. And there are, I know there are many, many people who are working on uh, Adivasi Mahasabha and uh, uh, Jaipal Singh Munda. So uh, from our respective angles, uh, different narratives will come and that should nuance the picture in the coming decade. I think his time has come. Uh, and uh, when some, I mean, when a, uh, ideas, time has come, nobody can really stop it. Uh, so, absolutely, so, absolutely. So, but yeah, Nandini's question, I, I just, uh, she uh, has a comment on, uh, it's not sure that Congress was shooting from Ambedkar's shoulders. Uh, I would say that's my interpretation of it. Uh, and, and I think given what I uh, uh, have analyzed of that context, there is reason to believe that Ambedkar was mellow, his Cong anti-Congressism was mellow in uh, that phase of uh, final drafting. Mind you, I mean, uh, November 1949, the constitution draft is finalized. The uh, draft fifth and sixth schedules were debated in September. So for almost three years, they are kept in uh, suspension. Uh, why? Uh, Jaipa Singh is raising this in time and again. Why aren't you discussing these provisions? The reports are there with you. So um, there is reason to believe that uh, Ambedkar was a party to uh, this uh, uh, scuttling of energies which Jaipal Singh Munda represented. And uh, uh, lastly, um, I would say, um, Mm, the history of constitution making in itself uh, uh, has suffered uh, because you know we have not we've given too much of credence to what is said inside the uh, assembly. Uh, if I would, if I can quote with your permission, with chair's permission, one last comment. Uh, Neera Chandhok makes it in a, a article on. Uh, in the Constituent Assembly uh, debate, she, she says, and I'm quoting her. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Ah. In countries that witness mass movements for freedom, constitutions are historically fashioned documents. 
they express the aspiration of the age and are a pact for the future. The text of the constitution cannot be read in abstraction from the political, the social, and the economic context. Sure. I completely agree with you. Absolutely. So, okay, Sagar, this was a pleasure. Thank you very much. We are really looking forward to seeing all this in more substantial terms. And we'll be in touch, of course. And thank you, everybody else who joined us this evening. Uh, our next uh, talk is on 4th February uh, by Sven Opitz. Uh, it's on uh, the politics of air and environment and data. Please join us. Uh, until then, Sagar, uh, we, are, we shall be in touch and uh, visit whenever the pandemic allows it. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you.